So every guitarist knows that the pinnacle of appreciation is receiving the stank face from your fellow musicians. Now this is often the result of one of those beautiful outside lines that seems to weave between the so-called wrong notes in just the right amount. In this lesson, I'm going to take a deep dive into the brain of John Schofield, who's one of the absolute masters of this. I'm specifically lifting some licks from a track called Just Don't Want to Be Lonely from his 2013 album Uber Jam Do. Now, if you're new to this idea of outside playing, this track, and in particular the solo, is a great gateway into hearing how Schofield effortlessly blends a diatonic inside approach with more outside advanced harmonic vocabulary. All the tab and slow, fast backing tracks are available on my Buy Me A Coffee support page. You can find the links down below. I hope you're sitting comfortably. Let's get into it. The track itself is a cover of an old soul tune by a band called The Main Ingredient. And this gives some insight into the way that Schofield's thinking about the harmony in the song. Now the original goes as follows. F major, D minor seven, G minor seven, and then a C9 sus chord. This is what we call a one, six, two, five, because we're going from the first degree, sixth degree, second degree, and then to the fifth degree. This is an incredibly common chord progression, originally used in George Gershwin's I Got Rhythm, and then adopted by jazz musicians as part of the 32 bar chord progression known as rhythm changes. Now the clever bit in Schofield's version is the repetition of F major, first inversion, and B flat major chords. It goes like so. All is not what it seems, however. If you listen to what the bass is doing, it's following that same one, six, two, five movement. Now this fundamentally changes the way that we view these two chords, F major and B flat major. If we put a D, for example, underneath F major, that will give us our D minor seven chord. And if we put a G under our B flat chord, that gives us G minor seven. That's our two chord. And if we then change the bass note to a C, that gives us our C9 sus chord. So why is this important? Well, key to understanding how Schofield creates his outside lines is how he views the six chord, that D minor seven, and the five chord, our C9 sus, or variations on it. You can think of that as a C7 chord if you like. chord in the key of F would typically be a C7. It's what we call a functioning five chord. As a dominant chord, it really wants to resolve from here back to the tonic chord. Now five chords really lend themselves to altered chord tones. So we're talking about the flat five, sharp five, flat nine, and sharp nine. Now for this lick, Schofield really zones in on the flat nine interval. Now the flat nine of a C7 chord is D flat. Now if we play a C7 arpeggio, so that's root, third, fifth, flat seven, but we replace that root note C with the flat nine, that's D flat. We've created a diminished seventh arpeggio. Now, what this means is that anytime we've got that functioning five chord, that C7 chord, or any variation on that C7, so our C9 sus, we can superimpose that diminished seventh arpeggio over the top of our C7 chord, and it outlines the sound of a C7 flat nine chord. 
there's a lot of tension there which really wants to resolve back to the one chord, even more so than a C7. Put a flat nine in there. And this is really what Schofield's using to create tension as resolving back to the one chord. He's also using what's known as an enclosure. Now, like the name suggests, we're targeting a chord tone and we're enclosing it with notes either side. So here we've surrounded the target E note, that's the major seven of F, with notes on the seventh, eighth, and 10th frets. Now after that little enclosure lick, we're then targeting that flat nine interval. There's that flat nine, so that's D flat, here at the 11th fret on the fourth string. Slide down to the 10th. And then we resolve back to that major seven. So under the fingers, we can view that A shape F major scale. So let's look at how we can potentially repurpose Schofield's lick to make it our own. So here you'll notice that I'm starting with that same enclosure idea, but then we're sliding into much more of an explicit diminished seventh arpeggio idea. And that'll really help outline that C7 flat nine sound. And then we just end with a little F major lick. So we're just visualizing that F major chord there. So this is another variation on that diminished seventh arpeggio. But you'll notice this time I'm jumping up to the D sharp and D flat notes there. And this is really helping to target the sound of C7 sharp nine and C7 flat nine. These chords often work in tandem and these will really create a lot of tension and then resolve back to the one chord. Now, as I mentioned before, the harmony in Schofield's version is quite straightforward. We can play that C7 flat nine to really help ingrain the sound of it when we're playing through the chord progression. So what I'm gonna do is play the same idea over a bossa groove. And here we're just going F major seven, D minor seven, G minor seven, to C7 flat nine. This should really help your ears to engage with the sound of that C7 flat nine chord. And then that potential substitution idea of using that diminished seventh arpeggio over the top of it. Now we can also view these diminished ideas as part of what's known as the half whole diminished scale, sometimes known as the dominant diminished scale. Now this is an awesome scale to use over functioning five chords because it picks up on some of those altered chord tones that we talked about before. From C, because we're playing over a C7 chord, it goes like so, root, flat nine, sharp nine, third, flat fifth, fifth, sixth, flat seven, and then back to the root. Now 
Now it's got this handy little symmetrical pattern as we go through the top four strings. So notice from the fourth string it goes like so, one, three, four, then it goes one, two, four, jumps back to one, three, four, back to one, two, four. So even though this half whole scale gives you a nice outside sound over the C7 chord, we're actually anticipating this chord by playing slightly early over that G minor seven. This will give you even more tension and outside sounds as we work our way to that C at the end where we resolve to the C, which is the fifth of our one chord. Now, the great thing about diminished seventh chords is that because it's made up all of minor third intervals, we've effectively got three different inversions that we can use of exactly the same chord or scale. So if we take this C and we repeat the same pattern three frets apart all over the neck, we've got our different inversions. So three frets below that. Three frets below that. so on and so on. So what this means is that any lick that you come up with that uses this diminished scale, we can repeat it all across the fretboard, three frets or a minor third apart, and you've effectively got an inversion of exactly the same idea and it'll work perfectly well over that dominant seventh chord. So here's a quick lick to show you how this might be used in the context of our 1625 backing. Now the functioning five idea that we looked at earlier, where the C7 wants to resolve down a fifth to the tonic, can be taken a step further by viewing the sixth chord in exactly the same way. You'll notice that D minor seven resolved down a fifth to G minor seven. Now what we can do here is do a really basic substitution. We can convert that D minor seven into a dominant seventh chord, D7, and now you can really hear that it wants to pull towards that G minor seven chord. So this is now acting as a functioning five chord, but this time resolving down a fifth from D seven to G minor seven. So what this means is all of those ideas that we looked at over C seven can now be transplanted over our D seven to create a D seven flat nine outside sound resolving to that G minor. So here we've got that same enclosure lick followed by a diminished seventh arpeggio, but just two frets higher than where we were before. So this time it's outlining the sound of a D7 flat nine chord. And then we just come down a little chromatic line So we've got another enclosure lick. So we're enclosing that chord tone there, that's the B flat, that's gonna be part of our G minor seven chord. 
all the way up to an A, and then we just resolve with a little F major pentatonic lick. So this beautiful line starts with a chromatic enclosure. Now you should be able to see from the graphic how we're accessing notes outside of that F major scale using the C shape. Now the lick at the end is what we're really focusing on here as it runs down a harmonic minor scale. Here Schofield's using what's known as a D Phrygian dominant scale. You can also think of this as being derived from a G harmonic minor scale. And this is pretty convenient because that's the chord that we're resolving to, G minor seven. But because we're playing over a D seven chord, we're starting on D. the same scale, just starting in a different position. So intervallically, we've got root, flat nine, major third, fourth, fifth, flat six, flat seven, and then we're back to the root. So you should be able to see quite clearly how a lot of the notes inside of this scale fit into a D7 flat nine chord. You've got the root, you've got the flat nine, you've got the major third, you've got the fifth, and you've got the flat seven. So even though the backing is playing a D minor seven chord, Schofield's really thinking of this as a D7 flat nine functioning five chord resolving to that G minor chord. And that allows him to access that D Phrygian dominant scale idea. And then the line at the end, super cool little lick. Now, if we think about what that is in the context of C, that's the chord we're playing over. So C7 or C7 flat nine, that note on top, is what we call a sharp 11. Super cool. Gives us that really sort of outside sound there. So here's a lick to show how you might repurpose the same concept. So this line starts with a pretty simple F major arpeggio. And then we run down our harmonic minor scale. This is D Phrygian dominant. And then we're back inside again. Now you've got to be a little bit careful with this one because that F sharp can potentially be a little bit clashy with that F natural that we've got inside that D minor seven. Now in a different context, this might stick out a little bit too much. You've really got to use your ears and decide whether you like the outside flavor of that particular note or not. Now I'm gonna play the same line over a bossa groove and you should be able to hear when we're playing over that D seven flat nine chord, that will really allow that D Phrygian dominant scale to shine through. So you'll be able to actually hear the harmony of that chord movement 
from that functioning five chord there, going to the G minor seven. Now, if you've really got to grips with some of the concepts so far, you can start to incorporate both. So we can potentially use D Phrygian dominant over that D7 flat nine, and then C half whole diminished over that C7 flat nine chord. So this one starts with a similar F major arpeggio. So over the D7 flat nine, we've got our Phrygian dominant. Resolving. And then over C7 flat nine, we've got our half whole diminished. So this is from back to that major third and F. 